emodels.co.uk. Make something awesome. everyone, it's Fox from Model Making Guru here. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to part nine of our build of the MPC 124th scale 22 inch Eagle Transporter from Space 1999 for emodels.co.uk. Yes, welcome to part nine. As you can see, we're finished. Thanks for watching. See you on the next build. Bye. <laughs>just kidding you know i'm kidding i've got loads to do yet uh, but as you can see I've, I've put it all together now most of it um just to make it easier to deal with when it comes to the weathering and i'll go through it's not all glued together so i'll go through that in a moment if you remember in the last episode we were finishing up all the decals where we left off that has now all been done and the whole thing has been gloss varnished to seal those in and you can see now it's come out rather nice now what i did like i said before there are there are two sets of decals in the kit there's the nice super duper duper cartograph ones which only come with the special edition version of this kit, which is this one. Uh, and that's all your little coloured uh, squares and rectangles, some of the orange symbols, um, and lots of little markings here and there. So all this stuff on the nose here. They've gone on beautifully. They've come out looking like they're painted on. There's no real clear film around them, no carrier film. It's just the coloured design. The other decals, the standard ones that come in both the special edition and the standard kit. So if you buy the regular kit of this, it's going to have the standard decals. The black panels and things, they're still nice. They've got more obvious visible carrier film, but it's masked a lot by the gloss coat now, and it's had lots of coats of Microset and Microsol. So that's kind of minimised. Once it's weathered and the matte varnish goes on, they'll look absolutely fine. Uh, but you can see the difference here. Well, you might not on camera, but I can, that the, um, the standard decals are thicker and a bit more shiny. So things like these markings here on the reconnaissance module, uh, the black for the, for the thruster areas, and on the nose, things like that, that's all done. But it's been gloss varnished and it's all nice and fantastic. Now what I did was, when you do, if you've got the special edition kit and you're doing these little coloured squares, if you remember, what I did was I used two, two sources of information. I used the sleeve that comes on the outside of the box, which relates to the special edition decals. And I also um, cut the sides off the box where it's got photographs of the model and those relate to the standard edition kit decals that's why the special edition decals are on that sleeve around the edge they don't want to print a whole second box so they just stick that sleeve around it i use those for all the to source where all the colored squares go and all the little markings and then some little tick marks and symbols and things but it only takes you so far um, you do get a lot of different markings and symbols and for most of them it doesn't say where to use them it's, it's more a case of here's a load of stuff just go for it uh, in the reality, for the filming models, there's probably so much variation between all of them that they're just used as many of the symbols they could find all the different models and give you the standard placements and the rest you can play with. So I did. I'd, I had some fun. Once I'd put all the, the coloured squares on, the sort of panelling squares that show up on the sleeve, I then used the rest of them, because you get tons, just to, to add extra pad out on the back, on the roof of the module here and on the walls. Um, I think... Don't really, didn't really put any extras on the, the pods because that was they look quite good. And I didn't put any extra ones on the, the command module. But on the reconnaissance module here and on the sort of fuel tanks here, I just added a few extra ones. I just used them all up, basically. And it just gives this nice panel effect. You can see a bit of variation there. 
so it's not quite just flat white. Now this is all stuff if you've got the standard edition that you could mask off and paint. Be a bit of a chore, but you get there. It would be a bit tedious. Uh, I also went to town with the stripes on the spine. Uh, followed the, the the placement on the sleeve of the box, uh, but then they don't actually give you enough of the red ones to do that because there's two different thicknesses. So I just kind of decided to wing it then and make up with some other colored ones. It doesn't really matter. Again, there were quite a number of different scale and just different filming miniatures so it probably varied between them anyway so don't worry about canon i don't care about canon as long as the main things are in the right place that's all i worry about so that's all done it's been gloss varnished so those decals are now sealed in and ready for weathering and that's the next step uh, now before we go to that i'll show you what what we've got so far you remember in previous episodes i've said how you don't have to glue all this together you don't the pods are not glued in they're just loose and i'm not going to glue them in because I want to be able to transport it. And I, for transporting, I can simply take those out because I'll have the delicate feet on the bottom. Take those out and put them to one side and put this in a container of some sort. So these have been taken off. I've not put these side frames on that go here just because I need to be able to get to these inside parts. So I'm leaving these off for now. Uh, so take those off. So these all come off. And this is the beauty of this. It is, for the most part, although you're supposed to glue these, you don't need to. So now you've got something that looks like out of Battlestar Galactica. Looks like a colonial freight ship of some sort. It does actually look completely different now. It looks like some sort of different sci-fi series altogether. Uh, the command module, as you've seen before, uh, the front part is not glued on. That's just loose because I took the bottom teeth off. The bottom here, so it's easily removable. But the top teeth remain, just hold it in place. That can come off, uh, so I can go in and you know turn the lights on or change the battery if the battery goes low. If I need to remove this part, this bit of framework here is not glued on either. Again, as I've said before, this is just stuck on with friction. It just clips into place and that's it. And with the extra paint and gloss varnish, it's just locked in place. It's not going to come off. So again, for transporting, if I need to, I can pop the nose off. Which also means, because that's not going to come off if I tap that, it's not going anywhere. Which also means I can leave these off. And when you've got the, when you've got these on, these also just lock into place. You don't need to glue these. Because I was... I was having visions of getting all this painted and weathered in here, all this bit down here, and then painting and weathering these, and then having to glue these on, and then having to go back and touch up because the glue ruins the paint in places and scrape paint off the little nub so it sticks. You don't, you might have to take this bit off, but these can just clip into place. That goes on, locks it in place. Your landing pad goes there, done. That's never gonna come off. So I am loving this fact. The, the engines at the back, exactly the same. This unit here and the piece of frame it's on, like you saw in the last episode, that's just snapped into place. It's not glued on at all. So what I can do is when I need to add the thruster bells at the end, I can pop this piece off, get the engines on, pop it back on again. And again, once you put the panels on here, they'll just lock into place and be held in place by the holes here and here and these pegs. So I don't need to worry about scraping paint off or gluing these. Uh, the pods themselves, I've not put the feet on yet. Uh, the feet will go in here. They will be glued in place, but you just glue this part. So that's not a problem at all. So I can scrape some paint off here and glue them on once they're painted up. Uh, the, the reconnaissance module, the corners here, these aren't glued on, these are just loose. Just out of the way, basically. Uh, but this reconnaissance pod is now permanently attached. It's not glued in place, it's two screws here and here. You remember when we did the spine originally, we had those two bits that I said you have to have pointing inwards because there's holes for the screws. That's what those bits are. Um, and literally the screw goes into the spine goes through the spine into the roof of the reconnaissance pod and then through the roof of that into that wall of the reconnaissance pod and it just locks it all in place so that's permanently attached now the reason I've put it on now I could have left it off however you can't actually see between here and the pod it covers up the pod door and most of the detail completely and when you put it in place it does scrape paint off because it's such a tight fit there's little um, little rings on this part on this pod that lock against little pegs on the reconnaissance uh, module. Now it does say if you want to be able to remove this to remove those rings, but you don't need to, I'm never gonna take this off, but it does scrape the paint. So I wanted to basically put it on and leave it on. You're not gonna see between the, between the pod here and the reconnaissance pod, you can't see that detail at all. So it doesn't matter if that bit doesn't get weathered, it's never gonna be seen. Um, so that's absolutely fine. When you're making a model, you don't always have to do every single thing. And I've said this before, you know, you I could go to all the trouble of painting the doorway on the reconnaissance pod and all that kind of stuff. It's never, ever going to be seen because this is not going to be removed. So the 
save yourself the time. You don't have to detail. You get some satisfaction from doing it, but if it's something that's never, ever going to be seen, don't worry about it. So that is permanently attached. I've not glued these parts because I need to get the windows sorted out. So we need to get these weathered matte varnished, then stick the windows on and then glue them in place. So that's to come. Uh, but other than that, it's on to the next step now. And so the next step is the weathering. Oh, there's one other thing I wanted to point out. Uh, and it's an interesting little thing. A little bit of history for you. Way back in the 70s, um, a lot of sort of British model makers who made miniatures for television and film, they used stuff called Letraset. Now, some of you may know what Letraset is. The younger of you won't have a clue. Way back in the day, and up till about 1990, I think, when they stopped making it, there was a product called Letraset, and they were A4 sheets of dry rub transfers, and they were thing they were mostly lettering, so different fonts, like you might get Helvetica or Garamond, and just like, you know, lots of A's and B's and C's and D's that artists would use to put very fine quality lettering onto their art, and it's just dry rub, you just rub on it, and it transfers over. They were a big thing in the days before computer-aided design and, you know, computer graphics and stuff, doing graphics on your on your computer. And a lot of model makers used those for little details, like little sort of panels and greebles. And they had lots of things like straight lines and dotted lines and symbols and shapes and things like that. And they were widely used on Space 1999. Now, the amazing thing about this kit in these special edition decals, no, not the special, in the standard decals, actually, get it right. They included a lot of the little shapes and symbols that were on the filming model, which means they included or basically reproduced letter set symbols and what they used were um, architectural symbols that letter set used to make an architect might be doing a floor plan of a building instead of drawing 15 different doorways he'd use letter set to rub the transfer on and that will be it they've actually reproduced those i'm going to show you a picture now and this shows two such symbols so you can see it's pretty cool a bathtub and what we, i think i've spoken to some other people probably like a shower an industrial sink or a shower basin or something on this kit and they've reproduced it perfectly so that attention to detail gets extra marks in mind. I just thought I'd point that out as a little historical detail and um, that's how people used to do lots of little details and shapes on models back in the 70s and 80s so if you know if you can get yourself you can still get it on like eBay and stuff the old sheets sometimes half used they don't make the stuff anymore but if you can get some get some because all the little architectural symbols and they have like electrical ones and architectural stuff and building design stuff they're great little symbols and if you look at other things on space 1999 like the 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 hand thing the oh, comlock can't remember the word then uh, a lot of the stuff on there is bits of letter set so check it out look up letter sets if you can get some for your models they're just great little ways of adding little details anyway let's crack on let's crack on so what is the next step the next step is the weathering uh, I have been thinking about how I'm going to do this, uh, so we will crack on, I'll get everything ready and we'll do that and I'll talk you through what I'm going to do. Back in a moment. Okay, so let's get on with the first stage of the weathering and the first stage is a wash. We're going to give this a wash and what the wash will do is make it look a little bit dirty, uh, but it's also going to hopefully collect in any recesses and give it some depth, make all the little details pop. Now, I have thought about exactly how I'm gonna do this, and the way I've decided is I need to reflect the fact it's on the moon. And if you look at any footage of, you know, the Apollo astronauts who were on the moon, yes, they were. Yes, they were. Um, look at their EVA suits. They were, even after just a day on the moon, they were covered in this dark gray powdery stuff. The, the regolith on the moon, the, the surface, is lots of very tiny, very sharp, pointy spicules. I like that word, spicules, little tiny fragments of moon dust. And it's like a dark gray color when it gets on your EVA suit and stuff. So a lot of the weathering on this is gonna be shades of grays and dark colors. We're not gonna to go too crazy, um, but I want to simulate some dirt and dust because in my head canon, this thing is on the moon where there's no real weather, it's just dust. But it does go onto planets occasionally, usually for some of the really pants episodes. So there would be, you know, dirt and dust accumulating. Now, in my mind, in my head canon, while they can easily, according to the law, according to the, the law of the TV series, while they can easily replace parts and repair them because they can use, uh, you know, the resources on the moon to make new components, they won't necessarily want to waste water washing them. So we're going to have some dirt and dust, but not like, you know, rust or anything like that. So what we're going to do, mostly used sort of shades of greys 
and not a lot of weathering. We're not going to do any paint chipping or anything like that. We're just going to do subtle stuff. So the first thing I've got is a wash, first of all, uh, to apply. Now, this is an oil paint wash. So it's basically MiG-502 Abteilung German Grey Highlight. And my favourite and yours, MiG-502 Abteilung Starship Filth. And what I've done is I've put a big dot of the German Grey Highlight in there. And I've added a slightly smaller dot of the... Um, Star Starship Filth, and then I've added some thinners. I've just used uh, these are Daler and Rowney low odor thinners for oil paints, uh, but any low odor thinners is fine. I mean, you can use things like white spirit and turpentine and stuff like that, but they stink, so I wouldn't recommend it. Just go to your local art shop and get some low odor thinners, or obviously, e models have things like um, the Ammo and the AK enamel thinners. Now, they're exactly the same, they're mineral spirits, so you can use you can intermix enamel thinners and oil paint thinners because they use the same thinners. So if, you know, if you've got some enamel paint thinners, say the Mega the Ammo stuff, that'll be absolutely fine. But you need quite a bit. So we've mixed quite a bit there. What we're going to do is get ourselves a big piece of tissue because this is going to get messy. And we're not going to just slop this all over. We're not going to do a Ted and... Slop it on. Yeah, we're not going to do that. But we do need a big brush. We're going to, we're going to be quite generous, but we're going to go fairly slowly so i'm just going to move the camera see if we can get a better view for you let's hang on let's just see if that's a better view a better view there we go so what we want to do is get this on while i try and lock the focus there we go get this on but not slap it everywhere so what i'm going to do is get my big massive brush I'm going to get some on the brush which is just off camera i'm going to take a lot of it back off this is going to be more like a filter than an actual wash really and all we're going to do is very gently just work it over the surface. Now what it will do, it will tint, gravity will pull it down, and it should just darken everything quite nicely. Now it won't really, because it's not that thick a wash, it won't collect massively in the recesses, but it will a little bit. Might give it some downward brushing more like a filter so it's going to just tint it and dark a little bit but it will ever so slightly collect in the recesses and what I may do later on when this is dried a bit I may go and do some more just to get it to collect if I need more to get things darker so we can do the same here on this side panel and this is where it gets tricky where you're doing it in here but you don't need to think too much just get it on there we're just tinting the surface for now. And it's quite difficult when there's a big camera in the way. Okay, so it's been about an hour and a half since I put the, the wash on. Now, I have to confess, when you saw me doing the wash, I was being all prissy and delicate and using little tiny amounts. And yeah, I realized after a little while, after done the first coat, the wash wasn't that dark, so it wasn't really showing up. It was tinting it a little bit, but it wasn't doing much in all the recesses. So after that, I was like, you know what? Let's just do a Ted and slap it on. So that's what I did. I just used more generously all over. And what I did was base the top part first, uh, apart from the command module, did the top first, let that dry for a little bit till it wasn't running everywhere, turned it over and did the bottom. And when I did the bottom, I did the command module uh, and then turned it over. This is the top, but when I painted this, I did the bottom bit and got the brush under here and turned it back over. And what you find is when you do these kind of heavy washes, you will get, it will pool. And th this was upside down, so it pooled here and you've got this nice fat tide mark. And also it kind of crept around these, uh, the anti-glare patches here. So you've got this beautiful tide mark here where it's gathered and collected. Now, this is the reason I've used oil paint wash rather than normal acrylic paint washes. If this was an acrylic paint wash, this model will be ruined because there's nothing you can do. I'd have to repaint all this and it'd be a right pain in the bum. I used an oil paint wash because oil paints, as you know, take a long time to dry. Uh, and what you can do with an oil paint wash, you can tidy up things like these tide marks, but you can also make sort of benefit, you can sort of use these to your advantage to extend the weathering. Here's what we're gonna do. I've got myself a dry, completely dry, soft, wide brush. And what I'm gonna do is this instead of removing this tide mark I need to weather this black panel anyway so what I'm going to do is very gently just feather it like this I'm just going to dab at it with the brush and what it will do is blend it and fade it 
and smear that paint around. I'm not really putting on much pressure at all, but I can go in heavy if I need to. I'm just gonna anchor it with my thumb as I knock the camera. And because it's oil paint, it takes ages to dry, so it's still workable. If this was neat oil paint, you could mix it around and fuss with it for days. Okay, so you can see there's some big fat tide marks here on the spine, on the roof of the uh, reconnaissance module. I'm really forgetting my words today. So again, what we can do here is just take our big fat brush, just get any paint off it, and we're just gonna very gently feather and fade. I'll just hold that in place. Now I want to keep some tide marky effects as I knock the camera again and again. I want to keep some tide marky effects because remember this is supposed to be dust building up. And dust doesn't build up in nice subtle gradients. It builds up as just edges and it gets wet when they go into planetary atmospheres and things. So I want some little bits of particly bits and tide marks. But not as obvious as I've just slapped a wash on. Okay, so you can see here we've got little splatty marks on here. Now there is lots more work to do on this, but for the moment we're just going to treat this as the first stage of weathering. If I do the brush flat, just get any excess off of my hand, very gently, just smudge it. Well, almost flat. I can clean it off without taking it from around the edge of the panel there. And I'm either removing it completely or I'm just kind of softening it. So if I do say, move the camera, if I do say this bit here, there's a bit of patchiness there. So if I just dab at it, I don't want to make it completely clean. I just want to blend it and make it look less like a tide mark and more like just dirt. So you can do circular motions, you can dab, you can stipple, or you can just drag it across the surface. There's different techniques you can use just for tidying up all the camera movements today, just for tidying up where there are tide marks just to blend them and soften them and make them look a bit more like dirt. And again, we're trying to create a kind of, it's dirt that's built up from powder. Uh, it's not dirt that's built up in liquid suspension. So you're not gonna have streaks and things like that, knocking the camera, sorry. You're not gonna have streaks running down, but you do want some things built up. So what I need to do is go around the whole of the ship now, wait for some of these, some of these are still wet, so I need to make sure they're all fully dry before I do it, go around, just fuss with this for a little while to get it blended and softened. Uh, and then the next step might be to go in with a slightly darker wash just around some of these edges to make them stand out even more. So I'll get that done. And when we come back, we'll do that little pin wash. Back in a moment. Every time. Becoming habit. Hello. So, yeah, you'll never fit that in there, as the bishop says to the actress. Hey, uh, hello. Hello. Yep, I can hear you. Hello. Hey. Yeah, mate. Can I? Hello. Yeah. Can I place an order for delivery, please? Hello. Yeah. Can I place an order for delivery, please, mate. Tony. Hello, mate. What are you on about? I don't work in a takeaway. Yeah. One chicken tikka masala. Hello. One chicken tikka. Th Hello? What? That's Fox. That's Fox. Hey, 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 Fox! Fox! You're working at the takeaway, can I have stuff discount? Can I? Can I? Stuff discount? Stuff What? You've just seen me ask for stuff discount. Did you not ask? I don't work in a takeaway. You know that. Have you been on the screech again? Hey, what? What do you mean you don't work in a takeaway? Well, why are you answering the takeaway's phone? That's just, I, I don't know, I just asked him that, didn't I? Why is he answering the takeaways for if he's not working the takeaway? Because I've rang you. You have been on the screech again, haven't you? Because I rang you. Because I rang Fox. You're busy, aren't you? You're, you're doing decals or something like that, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, love. Um, Fox lad. Oh, Fox lad. Yeah, did your phone do this? Uh, okay. That was weird. Idiot. 
Okay, so that is now done. I just had about 24 hours to dry, and as you can see, everything looks nice and slightly grubby now, which is quite nice. So that's the initial stage, as I knock the camera, as always. That's the first stage of weathering, just to tint it and filter it a little bit, make it look a bit grubby. The next stage is to go a bit more accurate uh, and get some moon dust, if you will, uh, around some of the the, re the the ridges and the edges and the recesses. Now what we're going to use for this is we're going to use the Ammo by MIG Blue Grey Panel Line Wash AMIG 1613. Uh, now this is an enamel product uh, and like the oil paint that we used in the last section we're going to use an enamel product here because it's easily removed without thinners very quickly uh, and we want to do some bits and bobs with this. So what we're going to do uh, you can see here I've got one piece ready uh, I have done what I'm about to do on this piece uh, and now I'm going to show you how to do it on this piece. What we're basically doing is we're just going around some of the, the panel lines and the ridges just to darken them a little bit and we wanted a bluey grey colour for sort of lunar dust not an earthy colour because we're not doing sand and dirt we're doing moon dust. Now this looks terrible but that's brilliant that's fine so what do we do? Well first thing we need to do is get the paint onto plastic. So we're going to take our panel line wash. Now the trick with this stuff is it is enamel, uh, but it separates out really quickly. So you'll have to shake it regularly. So give it a darn good shake before you go in with it. I've got a little mat here just so I don't knock it over. Now the trick is, like I say, it separates really quickly. So what you'll find is you'll need to keep shaking it every every you know five or ten minutes or so. Just when you're putting this on, you'll see it starts to become thinner and thinner. Just give it a good shake again. Now what we want to do is get it around all the edges and in all the panel lines. So I'm going to use this particular brush. Doesn't matter what brush you use, I'm just using something that's long and, and thin so I can drag it round. And the trick here is not to think and to actually do more than you think. So what you want to do is you want to load your brush up bigly, get some paint on your brush and just quite simply, do it on camera, just quite simply go around the edges. And you might be thinking, oh my god, this looks terrible. This is like worst makeup ever. But don't worry don't worry at all like I said this is like oil paint it takes to fully cure it can take up to 24 hours uh, depending on how thick you put it on it can take longer See, but you want to get it on there initially now because we gloss varnished it it should to a certain degree run around all the panel lines don't worry if it doesn't uh, because we've already put a, a, a coat of oil paint weathering on there it may be a little bit matte and rough so don't worry if it doesn't actually run everywhere. Okay, so here's the next stage in this process. And this is the cleanup. This has had about half an hour to dry. Uh, and what we want to do is basically get it looking like this, where it's a lot more subtle. It's not all brushed on and haphazard like it was a moment ago. So ignore this, ignore this decal. It's gone a bit wrong. I don't know why it's gone all lumpy bumpy, but it has, but ignore that, don't look at that. Anyway, it's underneath, you're never gonna see it. This is the easy bit. This is the fun easy bit. What you'll need is you will need the thing you've just painted half an hour ago, and you will need an cotton bud. No thinners, no thinners. Now, it's dry enough to the touch now, uh, because it's enamel, it's, it's, it's dried a lot, but it's still not fully cured, so it's easily removed, and all you do is literally rub it off so for example let's find a messy bit uh, here where some paint has gone over the edge get your cotton bud flat and just wipe it off so for all the big tops of panels just wipe it off now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do some streaking later on probably so I'm gonna actually do this in the direction of travel so I'm gonna do it like this and just take off any excess that's on the top of panels because I've got my cotton bud fairly flat it's not going to go into the recesses so it's just going to take the excess off the top I might leave some bits here and there just to suggest dirt and grime but for the majority I'm just going to get off any obvious brush marks like on that corner there uh, and I'm doing it this way because the direction of travel is that way just in case I do any streaking later on I might do I don't know yet there's a big blob there you can see now there's no blob <laughs> so that's that bit dead easy now the second bit is to tidy up inside these recesses and this is where it gets a bit more tricky but it's still really easy 
All you need to do is, again, you're gonna take advantage of the shape of the cotton bud. Now you need some good firm cotton buds for this, not fluffy ones, I'm using Johnson's cotton buds. So good quality, not cheap pound shop ones are best. All you're gonna do is you're gonna get the cotton bud into the recess, but instead of going like this and jamming it in, what you're gonna do is you're gonna drag it along so that it goes into the recess, but only just, so it just kind of cleans it up. So let's find a particularly dirty bit, like this bit here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get it like this. Again, it's parallel to the surface. And we're just gonna very gently, no pressure at all, just run it along that groove. And what it will do, where it touches the bottom, it will take the paint off. But because the sides are slightly sloped, it's not gonna take all the paint off the edges. It's done a bit there, and I can always go and put more back in if I need to. You may remove some bits you don't want to remove, but you can always go back. So we just need to do that, basically. And I'll do it this way. I'll stick to the direction of travel, sort of. Just very gently drag it along, and it will. it's really sort of blending it and fading it. And that's what we're after. Now, where you've got like an edge here, where you've got a step down like that, you want to get it at 45 degrees. You can either run it this way off the raised section so it fades it, and we'll do it on this bit. But that's not doing much. So what you can do is get yourself a new cotton bud. You will go through a lot of cotton buds doing this. Trust me. Get it at 45 degrees, and again, just very gently run it along. And again, it will take any excess, because of the shape of the cotton buds like that, it'll take any excess off this flat bit here, but it should hopefully leave it in the actual corner on the recess and where it does touch that bit it'll just gently fade it so you can see there those bits were quite bright now they've faded a bit and that's all you need to do just use your cotton bud cleverly go with the shapes that you've got don't use a lot of pressure I'm almost putting no pressure on at all and by using the shape of the cotton bud we're able to keep the, the gunk around the edge here, and where it does then go to no gunk, it fades rather than is a solid black line. It looks fairly solid on camera, I know. It looks like a black line's been painted. When you see it in real life, I'm just having a look now, it looks just la like, la 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 la. It's not even words. It looks just more like dust that's built up. Let's do, let's do these. Other end. Just slowly, very gently, work it out. Now, don't worry, like I say, if you if you do a bit and you suddenly take all that there, you take all the dirt off the middle bit there, that's fine. You can always go back and put on some more. It's not a problem. But remember, some randomness is kind of wanted. You don't want every single edge to be maybe, that's a bit difficult, that one, because there's no edge to work off, but never mind. Now, you don't want every single edge to be perfectly outlined. We're not doing a cartoon here. So some bits where you miss and you've got more, that's good. Some bits where you do too much and you've got taken too much off, that's also cool. So that is what I'm gonna be doing now. So I need to go off and do the whole ship, all the little recesses and bits where I've got to get in and get some gunk, I'll go and do this. And then when we've done that, that should hopefully then suggest that this is where what we're trying to suggest here is really where the moon dust has built up uh, on corners and just stuck. Because remember, like I said, moon dust, regolith, is kind of pointy little shards of rock. That's why it's pernicious. The, uh, one of the problems the Apollo astronauts had is that moon dust gets everywhere. And it gets into joints in machinery and then it just causes havoc. They had real problems with their EVA suits because it was getting into the joints in the wrists and the elbows and things like that. And it's, it acts as like a almost like a sandpaper, it grinds because it's sharp and spiky and it's basically rock. It grinds away at things, so it does tend to glom onto stuff. So go and watch some footage of the Apollo astronauts prancing about on the moon. They've got like dirty kneecaps and stuff where they've knelt down or fallen over. And it's just this dark grey, almost black smudgy crud. Uh, and they did have problems with it, getting into everything. They had to really be careful not to get too much of it in the actual lunar lander because it would have caused absolute chaos with the equipment. So anyway, I'll stop waffling. It's been a very history-laden episode, this one. I'll stop waffling and I'll go off and get the rest of the ship done. Uh, after this, I'm not sure what's after this. 
Now, when you're using, here's a trick for you. When you're using enamels and oils, um, some of you like to like do one layer of this, like some of you might have done the initial sort of wash and filter coat and then varnished it and then gone on with this coat. You don't need to, with the enamels and oils, if you're doing any kind of weathering, a good rule of thumb is if it's like a wash or a filter or this kind of pin wash, you can put it on there, work on it, and then leave it for 24 hours. If you come back after about 24 hours, then the initial coat should have dried enough that when you do the next layer of weathering, what you do shouldn't really disturb the previous layer. So it should be fine, just do 24 hours between each individual layer of weathering. When you've done all that, then you can start doing things like you know varnishes to protect those layers. But for these bits, we'll just do them. Each bit you're gonna see me do with enamels and oils, I'm just leaving 24 hours between. I'm not putting varnishes on this until probably the very end. Now you can see these are a bit messy, but that's fine. We've got work to do on these anyway. Uh, but again, you want some randomness. So anyway, I'll go and get the rest of the ship done. Might take me quite a while. And when we come back, I'm not sure what it is yet, but we'll do the next step. I'm back in a moment. Okay, so that's all been done. Uh, I will let you into a little secret. Although I started off uh, with the delicate pin washing, going around the edges very carefully with the brush and so on and so on, pretty much after about five hours of that, yeah, I got bored. So I just started just carelessly putting the paint on, especially on some of the sort of interior greeble details around these pods here. I just basically painted it on and around these bits on the, on the uh, module here, I just painted it over just carelessly with a bigger brush. It doesn't really matter because you're rubbing most of it off, so you can do it more like a gunk wash if you want. Um, you don't have to do it as a pin wash. It depends how you want to do it. But that took about, well, it took most of yesterday, um, purely because, although normally when you do a pin wash, you give it about 10 or 15 minutes and it's dry enough to touch that you can rub it off. For some reason, some of it was taken up to an hour, an hour and a half to actually be dry enough that I could rub it off. So do keep that in mind. Work in steps, so like I did the side, then I'd let that dry and I'd rub it off. Then I'd do the, everything on the top. Then I'd let that dry and rub it off. Then I'd turn it over and do the bottom. You don't want anything running anywhere. It just gets messy. Um, so the rule of thumb basically is, if you're doing a pin wash, it's about 10 or 15 minutes, rub it off. If you're doing anything else, just do it when the paint no longer looks shiny and wet. As soon as it looks dry and matte and not shiny, it could be anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour, just go in with your cotton bud and rub it off. My, my glove just farted. No, it won't do it again, never mind. Um, you can do it when it's wet. You don't have to you know, wait for it to dry. It's just that if it's still wet when you try to rub it off, it'll just smear everywhere and you might lose the effect of keeping the paint in some of the recesses. So let, let it just go flat and, and not shiny. Uh, but that took me most of yesterday. So what's the next step? You can see here we've I've reassembled the spraying area. Um, now I did explain when I first started doing this, this isn't my spray booth, it looks a bit haphazard, it's just my workbench with a sheet behind it and some paper down. This is too big to get in my spray booth, so there's no way I can spray my spray booth. So this is what I'm doing, so I'm just protecting my desk basically from the spraying. Uh, now I will be having to wear a mask, so I'll talk about that in a second. But the next step is to recreate, basically, uh, if you imagine this thing takes off and lands, all the thrusters underneath, they're kicking up dust whenever it's taken off the landing, and it goes everywhere, it billows out from underneath. So we wanna try and suggest that that's collected and, and made the, dirt, the underside dirty and filthy. And we're gonna use a different color for this. We're gonna use Streaking Grime for DAC AMIG 1201. It's a bit lighter and a bit more bluer, well, hopefully, a bit more bluer. Uh, so it's a bit more like moon dust. I did think originally the panel line, panel line wash blue gray was about the right color. However, it did come out a bit more brown than I'd hoped. But then I realized at the bottom here, it looks blue gray, at the top it's kind of brown. So I don't quite know how that works, but it looks fine. It's fine for the for the, for the the pin washing and for the, the little creases. So we're gonna use the uh, Streaking Grime for DAC. And instead of my normal Iwata Neo, I'm gonna be using my Iwata Revolution. It's a bit old and knackered and I don't think the nozzle quite works very well. Uh, but the reason I'm using this is I know 100% this is solvent safe. So we, this is an enamel paint, again, it's not a panel line wash, it's a streaking grime, but this is enamel. So when I come to clean this out, I'm gonna have to use things like my oil paint thinners and isopropyl alcohol to clean it out. My Neo was, I got it just before they started confirming it was solvent safe, so I don't know 100% if it is solvent safe. So the last thing I wanna do is put isopropyl alcohol uh, through that brush on the off chance it's not solvent safe and it corrodes the, the seal. So I'm not gonna put through my Neo, put through this. This is a 0.5. Um, and it's got a horrible evil button trigger that I don't like. So we'll see how it comes. We'll see how it comes out. So let me go and get everything ready. I need to do a quick um, thing about masks and ventilation and then we'll crack on. 
Back in a moment. Okay, before we go, I have a face on the TV, which is why I just had a face. If I were to, if I were to ever use my any kind of height, doesn't matter what it is, a cricket, oil, an owl, fire, doesn't matter. Always, always, always wear a respirator. Not a doctor, a respirator. It will stop you from dying. Every kind of height is toxic. You will die. So, well, I'm not afraid to get my face in, because I can't. I am going to have my face in on to suck some of out. But, regardless of that, I go to wear my respirator, and I don't die. Also, these are my old glasses, not my new glasses. I don't want to get them covered in paint and crap. So, if you've got a fair pair of glasses, an old pair, a fair pair, wear those. Just to avoid covering your glasses in crap. So, let's go on and we'll get this painted. Wait a minute, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that either. I didn't say... What the... I didn't... I'm never going to ask Tony to do my hook for that one again. Tony! <sighs> I don't know. Can't get the stuff. Anyway, right, so here we are in the makeshift spray booth. Respirator on, extraction fan going. We are applying the MIG Streaking Grime for DAC, A MIG 1201. Uh, now, what we're going to be doing is we've got the pressure quite low. It's a very thin paint. All the enamel weathering products, the streaking grimes and the panel line washes, are quite thin. You don't need to thin them for any reason. So straight into the airbrush, nice and neat. We've got the pressure on the compressor down to probably, if I remember rightly, about 12 to 14 psi. Nothing major. Golden rule of thumb with airbrushing is, if it's a thicker paint, up the pressure. If it's a thinner paint, you can drop the pressure. So something like Pledge is down to about 12. These kind of enamel weathering products, 12 to 14, something like that. It depends on your equipment, so try different settings. Now you'll see here I'm moving the airbrush all over the place. That's because I don't want the paint to build up. I want to get a nice sort of misty, fluffy, soft, tinty coat. I don't really want to do painting. It's just really darkening it and dirtying it. So I'm moving the brush constantly. I'm keeping it a reasonable distance away and I'm just building up that kind of dusty effect. I will focus more on the underside, but you'll see in a minute I'll flip it over and I'll just put a little, I'll just concentrate on the lower sort of parts of this vessel as well because the dust would kick up and go up and I'll put some on the top but not very much because I want it all over but focused mostly on the underside. I will do some say for example on the command module but I'll do more underneath than I would on top. On top it's just a very light coat. This also has a second advantage that where it is applied it will also mat the shiny surface down, the shine from the gloss varnish. So depending on how this comes out it may mean at the end of this whole project I might not need to matte varnish it. But we'll see, I might need to. I mean those little anti-glare sort of panels on the on the command module are quite shiny, so I might need to do some work on those. So it might still need a matte varnish. Uh, this is at uh, more than normal speed, by the way. I don't I'm not normally this manic. I don't work quite that fast. Ugh, every time I turn the camera on, one of my neighbours decides it'd be a great time to mow the lawn or angle grind some flagstones. It's like, oh, can you just, just for one day not do something? I don't know. Anyway, we are done. That's done now. It's had about 24 hours to dry. It's still not fully touchable. Uh, if you touch it, you'll rub it off. So I've got gloves on and I can't show you underneath because I don't want to pick it up and handle it. But the underneath is nice and dusty and a bit darker and browny, bluey grey. On top, it just looks a bit more grubby. It's not dirty filthy it's just grubby and it doesn't really show on camera because the, the way the camera works and the white balance it just looks like a white spaceship but it certainly does look a bit more grubby with the misty coat of the streaking grime for DAC and then we've got the sort of the, the panel line washes of the other color what was it panel line wash blue gray just makes it look like there's been a buildup of dust it just kind of I'm really pleased with how it's come out and it's kind of minimal uh, now a handy tip for you when you've done that dusty coat if you want to suggest like people touching the ship and wiping the dirt off, it's very easy. Like I did on the transit van, uh, all you do is after it's had about 10 minutes, get yourself a cotton board or a very fine brush or a cocktail stick or something and just 
rub it. I actually I accidentally did a bit here. You won't really come out on camera, but there's a little patch there that's clean because I touched it with a cotton bud by accident. I didn't mean to. And I thought, oh yeah, brilliant, I can do that. So I did the same around the door handle and the keypad here for the access to the door, just to remove some of the grime. Just so it looks like people have been touching that part of the ship and it's cleaned the dirt off. It's just a nice little touch. Now, as ter in terms of weathering, aside from two other things, that's pretty much all I want to do. As, like I said at the start, it's not going to be heavy weather. This isn't my normal battered beaten look. This is, it's on the moon, so it's not got rain and rust. It's just got dust. So that's about as far as I want to go. The only things left to do, and we'll do these in the next episode, are I do want to do some dark patches uh, where there's been exhaust from the thruster bells underneath, just to suggest heat and you know carbon deposits and things like that. Uh, and a little bit of dry brushing on the feet when I do the feet, just to suggest they're more of a metal than, uh, the, the, you paint them gray, but I'm gonna sort of dry brush them a bit with metallics to make them look more like worn metal. Uh, but that's about all the weathering. I did consider, and I had conversations with my followers, about doing lots of, you know, making it super realistic and having lots of dark patches around the, the front of the nose and underneath and on the fronts of the pods here and underneath the, the whole superstructure for carbon scoring. Like when it's, you know, it's entering or when it's entering an atmosphere, obviously it's surrounded by superheated plasma like a spaceship does and it would have lots of carbon deposited and it'd look really dark and dirty. Go and look at a real rocket that's, that's done atmospheric re-entry. It's black all over where it, where it touches the atmosphere. I thought about that and I decided not to do it. And there's a very good reason. When you're making a model, there's two ways you can go. You can go as realistic as you possibly can, or there's not quite that realistic because it doesn't really work. And what I mean by this is, if I was to paint lots of carbon scoring where it would enter the atmosphere, it's so all around here and on there, people would come in, they'd look at this, they'd say, that looks brilliant, but why has it got loads of black spots all over it? Why has it got these big dark patches at the front? That doesn't make any sense. I don't know what that is. Is it a bad paint job? That's the problem. Certain things, although in your head, in your head canon, you may have a perfectly reasonable explanation as to what you've done and why it's on there. Other people won't see that. And they'll just be like, looks brilliant, but you've ruined it with this big black thing on the front or on the, on the pods there. What's that all about? And they'll think it's a bad paint job. So I'm not gonna do that. There's a trade off between what you think looks realistic and what other people would understand. And sometimes you have to look at it and go, yeah, I'm not gonna go that far because people won't understand why I've done that. They won't understand why it's there and it'll just make it look like a bad job. So I'm not gonna do anything like that. I'm gonna leave it like this, apart from some, you know, sort of blasty type marks underneath, which we'll cover in the next episode. One other thing I wanted to point out, I'm waffling, I know, we're getting there, nearly the end, nearly the end. Um, you remember when I put the decals on, the decals for the anti-glare panels on the schnoz? Two decals, the side one here, uh, and the bottom one here that goes on the bottom, strangely enough. I complained a bit because I said they didn't fit. You push them together in the middle to cover up the joint in there, but you get these gaps around the edge and I was like, oh, well, there's not much I can do about it. It'll, it'll have to do. Apparently, uh, one of my good followers on Facebook, Robert Hobby, goes by the name Robert Hobby, might not be his actual real name, um, was quite pleased. He said, you're the first person I've ever seen that's made an eagle and got the anti-glare panels correct. Uh, and I didn't realize this even though I've been looking at pictures of the studio model. If you look at the studio model, the anti-glare panel doesn't go to the edge. It actually has this white lip around there and around the side, and then naturally it sort of complements this white lip here. Uh, I'll show you a picture of one of the studio model pods here, and as you can see, there's that lip. So purely by accident, I managed to replicate that without realizing it, and I admitted that. I didn't say, yes, I planned that from the start. I'm an honest man. So I bitched a little bit about those two decals. However, it seems they're perfectly designed to fit exactly as they should. So if you push them together to meet in the middle, you will get a natural little gap around the edge there. I hope that's on camera. Uh, and a little gap around here. So kudos to MPC for that. And not kudos to me for bitching because it wasn't quite right, but it turns out it was exactly right. They know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Got to tell you, if this is the kind of quality that round two are doing now, I hope they do lots of other kits as re-releases. I mean, I'd love them to do uh, a new Federation runabout because the old kit, I've got one waiting to be done. The old kit was a bit gash. If they could retool a runabout, that'd be brilliant. Or the Defiant, the USS Defiant, that was a terrible kit. If they could retool that to not suck, it'd be brilliant. So if this is anything to go by, then yeah. Round two, we need more re-tools of studio models like this, runabouts. Defiance, other Starfleet ships, things things that were traditionally really, really terrible kits by MPC and companies in the past, and Ravel and Monogram. 
some of those kits were terrible. That's why I stopped making Star Trek models after many years. I'd, I used to make Star Trek models all the time, and then I stopped for a few years making models, and when I got back into it, I'm like, yeah, I'm not going back to those. So, yeah. Kudos to NPC for that. When you make this, if you're making one of these, push those two together, get them in the middle, and make sure you have this gap around the edge. That is correct. Apparently, like I said, he said, I was the first person ever seen that actually done that. And that was purely by fluke. So anyway, that's going to do it for this episode. Next episode, we'll do the last little bits of weathering. Uh, I need to get the legs all painted up, and I need to paint the metallic parts, so the, the thrusters here on the schnoz. I need to get the little the bar that goes under the leg. I need to get the cone, the end, the thruster bells at the back done as well. Um, not fully decided how I'm going to do those yet, but I've got a few ideas, and I'll do some testing on spoons uh, to test what I'm going to use. Uh, once all that's done, it's kind of a matte coat, and then we're done. So. I've got to the windows as well. So hopefully the next episode should be the last one. We'll get everything, all the little bits wrapped up and get the legs glued on and things. But until next time, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Uh, as always, uh, do make sure to pop along and visit my very, very good friends at emodels.co.uk. They're my sponsors and I'm making this video for them. Um, it's, in my opinion, the UK's leading model store, online retailer. They've got tons of stuff, everything you could possibly need. And as we always say, if they haven't got it, you don't need it. If you can't find something on the website, it's either just temporarily out of stock or it's something they don't currently carry. But if that's the case, don't panic. Drop them a mail anyway. If it's something that's out of stock, they can let you know when it's back in. If it's something they don't normally carry, they may well be able to get it for you. I've seen them do it. They get stuff for customers that they don't normally carry. So just drop them a mail. If you're after something and it's not on there, there's either something better on there anyway, or drop them a mail and ask them, When's it in stock or can you get it for me? And they'll be happy to oblige. Uh, but yeah, go and check them out. Absolutely brilliant store. Um, this is going back to them when it's finished and I'm going to be really sad. I'm actually thinking, you know, I'm loving this so much. I'm really having fun doing this and it looks so awesome right now and I'm really happy with it. I want one. I want one for myself, for my own cabinet. However, the problems are, A, my cabinet's not big enough and B, it's, you know, it's, it's a big expensive kit, so... I want one, but I don't want to necessarily go through the whole making process. I don't know. It's really, it's, I don't know if I'd want to make one again, but I really want to not have to give this back. Pete, mate, can I keep it? Can I keep it, please? No, I won't. I'll take it back to them. And then I'll just have to go down to the store regularly and, and look at my baby. I'm really happy with this. I'm really having, I've not had this much fun on a, on a non-Gumpler plastic model kit for a long time. But this had its share of frustrations, but now it's coming together. It's like, so anyway, I'm waffling again. I always do this. You probably stopped watching like 10 minutes ago. Nobody, I get this impression, right, that none of you out there have actually ever watched the end titles. I bet you didn't know I recorded a whole separate piece of music for the end titles. Most of you probably never seen it. There's a whole separate piece of music for the end titles. There you go. That's the trouble I go to, you see. But anyway, shut up, Fox. Do you know, I really can't help myself. Anyway, right, I'll go away. Take care of yourselves. Go make something awesome. Go be awesome. And until next time, adios amoebas. Wrinkly glove. It's making noises. Making little farty noises as well. <laughs>